Hey folks, in this episode, I'm sitting down with Tom Jens. He is a inner city street photographer. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today I'm speaking with Tom Jens, who's made a lifetime career uh, out of making an impact in inner cities by literally telling stories, photojournalism and street photography and writing about inner city sort of issues and all the things that, you know, I'm no stranger to, but we're going to dive in to all of that stuff in this episode of the podcast. Tom Jens, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you. No, yeah, it's my, uh, my pleasure. In Milwaukee, so it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like about 15 degrees outside. <clears throat> oh, man, you're you're right in the middle of that, right? So, well, no, 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 we didn't get it as bad as like Buffalo, but, but we got a cold, really. Cold. You got the edge of it. Yeah, you yeah. got the edge. Crazy, crazy times. Well, let's let's dive in with some just, a you know, a quick introduction for the folks that may not be familiar with you and your work. Give us your, you know, sort of elevator pitch origin story about who Tom Jens is and why do you love picking up a camera? Why do you pick up a camera? Why are you compelled to tell stories? Yeah, I come out of the uh, television uh, journalism. I, I do, I've done TV uh, documentaries uh, and uh, cable network TV shows for like discovery and history. That's kind of my background. <clears throat> but I've always been a photographer on the side and, uh, and always been a writer. So um, in the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years, I've just focused on photography and, and writing, photojournalism. Yeah. And, yeah, but that writing that you focused on, the, the tool or the craft, you know, notwithstanding, great photographer, great photojournalist, and a great storyteller, but where you're aiming those guns at, where you're aiming your talents at, is where the real impact is. And that's what I did, what we talked about in the tease a little bit, the, it, documenting and doing street photography inner city. So let's let's talk about that a little bit and what compelled you sure. to to sort of dive into that that space. Okay. Yeah, I've spent a number of years traveling around to small towns in the Midwest and West shooting uh, pictures of people that I met and telling their stories. And uh, I don't know, about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I thought it would be interesting to do this a similar approach in the uh, urban inner city, the black community in Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee is a uh, one of the most segregated cities in the country. You could parallel Milwaukee's black uh, community to St. Louis or Newark or Baltimore or Detroit or, or Chicago in terms of isolation and segregation for a lot of the black population. Forty percent of the uh, population in Milwaukee is black. Yeah. So I started uh, doing something a little different than most street photographers I've seen, and that is I started walking the streets of the, of the inner city of Milwaukee, uh, just getting out of my car and walking, started walking. And that was quite an adventure because uh, I'm the only white guy walking the streets. But um, I, I have this kind of system where I try to make eye contact with, uh, with people walking on the streets. Uh, uh, most people don't like to make eye contact. But when I did, I tried to maybe just smile and stop and talk to them, ask them a little about their story, you know, what their background is. And uh, and that led to uh, not only me writing about this, but also instead of doing traditional street photography where you kind of hide in an alley and shoot pictures of what's going on, I would, I would do casual portraits of the people that I met and, uh, and tell their stories. So... Th through the process of doing this, uh, the racism issue started heating up throughout the country, and after mainly after the George Floyd incident uh, and a few other incidents. But um, that was kind of an explosion for Milwaukee. There was a lot of protests, uh, a lot of uh, there was some violence, some rioting, but it was just a lot of anger on the mainly on the black part of the black community. Mm -hmm. Well, I've gotten to know a number of the street leaders, and that gave me an inside uh, story to uh, black the black power people in Milwaukee. 
And uh, so I started telling their stories. And many of them went on to today become uh, significant leaders in this town. Uh, to get, mention a few, the sheriff of Milwaukee County is black, a woman. The, mm -hmm. the police chief is black in Milwaukee. And even the mayor is, is black. And there's, there's many others. But those are just people I had gotten to know before, uh, you know, before they ran for office and won. Yeah. So, so you did the um, you did the true photojournalism thing, right? Long term, though, like photojournalists, yeah, the term. good, yeah, good photojournalists will will become not part of the story, but sort of meld in, so that they're not seen as sort of a a threat or you know all of the things that would go along with this sort of this foreign this foreign matter entering into our safe space right and and with yes. you you're like i, I want to talk about i want to dive into that being white and then and then being in a you know i would argue probably 99.9 .9 .9 with you being the 0.1 percent yes. black community uh -oh. Uh -oh. yeah how do you duck. like uh -oh. how do you approach that you know a white duck in the pond of black ducks is what i, what I yeah would. exactly yeah or a piece of salt in the in the pepper right so like how are you how are you when you were in the first sort of starting out right uh -huh. how did yeah. you notwithstanding you know any sort of violent stereotypes or any of that stuff just being different it's almost like an American traveling to a foreign country and everyone yes. knowing you're an American, mm -hmm. right? So right. was it that same kind of vibe of you're just like, I know I'm different and let me show them that I'm not a threat or I'm not here with malintent? Like what, yes. what was going through your mind? Yeah, you're right. Whenever I would uh, walk the streets or be involved in any kind of event where I was the only white person there, yes, I felt ironically like probably a black person would feel when they go out into a white suburb you know it, mm -hmm. it, it was a very eye-opening experience for me to actually experience you know experience that feeling mm -hmm. and uh, and my intention wasn't to you know become a part of of the group so to speak or the the community because that's not possible but my intention was to tell those stories because so few, as far as matters of fact, I, I don't know of anyone in the country, a writer or a photojournalist, who's truly delving deep into the inner city black culture and telling their stories. I'm, by them, I mean the residents, street leaders, community leaders, uh, you know, people who, who live there and who want to live a good life, but are often victims of just a small amount of criminals, you know, yeah. that, are, that have kind of a third world economy going. And those are the stories we, we see, right? It's not that we don't get stories out of those communities. The stories that we do get are when something happens, some murder, or some drive-by, or some sort of big whatever, something negative is used. That's what, what the stand-up reporters are on the corner reporting, right? But if something awesome or positive is happening, we don't really get a glimpse into, into those things, yeah, exactly. which right. paints the right. picture of those communities just being bad and dangerous and Mad Max, right? And just legal yes. all out the window, which is not the that case. Used to, that used to really anger me. It still does, actually, that the mainstream media or local television news in the case of Milwaukee or Chicago don't embed themselves in the community. They could even do that with their black journalists. But the mainly the only time they cover the inner city of in the case of milwaukee black community is if, if there's been a crime committed right particularly yeah. a homicide then they're all over it you know and that's then they're out they're gone with a matter of you know a 10 to 15 minute stand up you know talking point by a blonde you know uh, tv reporter and back yep. to back to the desk the main desk and, and then they walk away so yeah, yeah. Um, it, it paints a picture of um, an unfair picture of what's really happening in the, in the inner city, black inner city. And, and a lot of the residents are very resentful of that, and they're very mistrustful of the media. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, can you blame them? You know, no. <laughs> like, I'm, I, mean, I mean, I mean, a lot of people, not just those communities, right? <laughs> a lot of people are distrustful of the media. But, you know, I'm, I'm curious when you when you look at photojournalism, this is a photography podcast, right? Yes. So when when you look at the photojournalism aspect of this and how we kind of 
talked about your uh, the good photojournalists will kind of not become an adjutant in the community so that they can be accepted and document what's yes. going on effectively without influencing. How are you able to do that long term, though? Because it's one thing, you know, to go in and like, you know what, I'm going to document homelessness in, in, in San Francisco. I'm going to hang out and they, you know, let them know that this is what I'm doing. So nobody's going to mess with me and all that. And then you get in, you get out. How are you able to do that on a long term, multi year? I, I, don't, I don't do any of that. I don't go in and say I'm doing this for, you know, two years. So you can trust okay. me at all. Okay. I just, I just show up, you know, and as I've gotten uh, close to some, particularly some of these street leaders and nonprofit leaders, then I'm invited to their events without even like, you know, it's not that I'm white, it's that I'm, that I'm objective. You yeah. know, I'm going to report right. on this in a fair, objective way. Yeah. And I'm going to talk to people. So I've just tried to be neutral in that regard. Follow me. Yeah. And what, what's kind of interesting through these years that I've been doing this uh, is I've really gotten very upset with racism. It's particularly acute since the George Floyd incident and a few other things. But mm -hmm. um, I just find it uh, almost like the, uh, how do I describe it? It's one of the most sinister problems, in, not only in our culture, American culture, but in the world. It, it's an insidious thing racism yeah mm -hmm. and and uh look you know we are here we are you're black i'm white we've probably both been educated and we're talking okay yeah mm -hmm. and uh and what about it you know do we have to be we have to keep saying i'm white and you're black and let's right. talk about that it's, it's it doesn't like, matter yeah we just talk you know yeah, it's interesting yeah. you bring that up. You know, I had a uh, last year I had a, a great conversation with a, a good friend of mine, um, Pai Jersa, and we we were talking about racism, and this was in the wake of the whole George Floyd. We, so we did kind of a special episode on racism, and because we're yeah. both you know melanated people, so we were basically one of the things that came up was we were kind of. Exp where we were talking about our various experiences with it and how it how racism shapes who you are today, even day to day. And one yes. of the things that, that you were saying that it triggered that memory for me is just the the insidiousness of racism, you know, as a photographer, as whoever you are, right? Is the the one side is racism and then the on the other side i call it bi-directional prejudice so in one direction you may be someone may be i use the example of starbucks right this is the insidiousness of racism right because it's almost like a ptsd kind of thing and a fight or flight mentality that that black people or people that are being discriminated against or oppressed in some way have to go through on a daily basis in the case of a starbucks you go into a Starbucks as an African-American person, you give them your name, and maybe the Starbucks is mildly crowded, but for some reason you feel like two people's names got called before yours. So instantly, or maybe not instantly, but at least a, a part of your brain is going to flip and say, are they, you know, are they going first because I'm black and they put me behind them? Is there a special black cue? Sure. Right. When the reality is there's some other thing that they were before you, you know, fair and square. But, you, you know, the insidiousness of racism is that your brain even has to process those cycles that, oh, is this happening because I'm black? Did they seat me in this part of the restaurant because I'm black? Did they show the realtor show me these houses because I'm black? When... The reality is it may not, it probably is not that, but even if it's a 0.2% that it is that, that's a non-zero, which is like, you know, this is where it all gets complicated, right? It's like the a big jar with 2000 jelly beans in it and all of those jelly beans, except for one are safe and that one contains cyanide that's going to kill you instantly. That means that whole jar of jelly beans you have to be suspect of and approach with at least a little bit of caution or thought that this might kill me. So you got the, the we we ha I use that analogy in the context of a uh, police stop and not all police are bad, yes. one bad apple and all that stuff and I'm like, yeah, but one bad apple in a bushel is 
dynamite, <laughs> you know, um, which is going to kill me instantly if I go near it. But the rest of those apples in that bushel are beautiful and delicious. That means I can't go near that bushel, right? If, mm-hmm. if unless I'm a betting man, and that's that's the insidiousness of racism and how it triggers what I call bi-directional prejudice. You know, so you may be someone may be prejudiced against you, or you may be hypersensitive and think they are when they're not. In either case, these are negative feelings flying back and forth, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a difference. This is, I'll just give you my opinion. There's a difference yeah. between racism and prejudice. Yep. Racism, you know, if you're racist, you know, go find, go find someone to hang out with because, you know, we shouldn't have anything to do with it. If you're prejudiced, that's different. <clears throat> you, you, we all came up in a different way, in, in a different lifestyle. <clears throat> and we've accumulated prejudices. And one of the things I do, not with everyone, but with many black people, is I will try to engage them in a topic about prejudice. And I will tell them that I'm prejudiced in certain areas, thanks to my upbringing. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have a bad upbringing or anything, but I, I didn't grow up around you know the inner city culture. So, right. You know, I have certain prejudice against it, and and then they will tell their prejudices, and lo and behold, we can can't we talk about it and and still have some kind of understanding of where we're coming from? Yeah. The, the black culture, inner city black culture, is way different than the rural small town cu- culture about fifty miles away in northern Wisconsin. It, it's just. You know, 180 degrees difference in terms of their values, how they talk, uh, how open they are, um, whether they're emotional or not, uh, their their taste in music or art, or it's different. Yeah. But we're all Americans, okay? And this is what I like about America, that I can see the, the good in both kind of cultures. You know, and and that that's kind of what I'm trying to get at sometimes when I have a discussion with people. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. You know, when it, it and it's a it's a yeah, it's a Gordian knot that may not be yeah. able to un- be unraveled in, in our great grandchildren's lifetimes. You know, but you know, it, that is not to no, say it's not it's started, not worth an effort. Know. Right. If we talk yeah. about it. I mean, yeah. like, I, no, I, I know we, when we talked before, you, you, you grew up in Chicago. You had yeah. some experiences that were Absolutely. unpleasant yeah. because you were on the south side of Chicago. And yeah. um, I didn't have those experiences. And, and yet I can, I can feel for you. I, I can absolutely feel disgusted that, that just because I happen to be white, that, you know, Somehow it rubs off on me. I mean, I do feel guilt there, yeah. but I'm trying to understand. Follow me. I'm trying, yeah. to, I'm trying to understand what you went through, yeah. and uh, and what other people that I've gotten to know have gone through in their lives. And I've done stories on uh, four different stories on on these are black men who've been in prison for homicide for uh, quite a number of years, and have come out somewhere in the last oh five or ten years and have absolutely turned their lives around they've, they've become just great human beings yeah um and i think those stories need to be told too it's like you know you're not just put away somewhere uh into a, a jail or a prison and then you're forgotten about i mean that, that that's not a good way for society to evolve it, it's a very bad way for society to evolve yeah so you know, um i'm trying to cover that aspect too yeah yeah so on a on a day-to-day basis i'm curious when you're you know you're out there and you, you have your camera with you and you're you're doing your thing you're telling these stories how do they mm-hmm. unfold like in in the intro i mentioned you are a street photographer right it, photo wow. photographing inner city is it are you like the i'm just going to roam around and let serendipity throw a story at me and then i'm going to follow that thread and then put that together for the publication or mm-hmm. are, are they more structured where you're like okay here is a story that is not getting enough daylight i'm going to aim my camera at it because i feel like that's where i can have the greatest yeah. impact well if i'm if i'm just at an event that i've been invited to you know a black event or if i'm walking a street and i 
engage someone in conversation if I find them interesting by just doing a, not exactly an interview, but just, you know, concern. What's mm-hmm. your life like? How are you doing? You know, just like anybody would when they talk, when you talk to somebody on the street. If it's interesting to me, if I think it's a story, I will then expand on it in our conversation and then eventually ask them, would you mind if I uh, wrote about this or recorded our conversation? And would you mind if I took a, a portrait of you? And then I already in my mind have thought about by looking around where it would be a good fo- place to photograph them with a good background to kind of tell their story. Now, if it's a, if it's a nonprofit leader or, or a politician or something, then I go directly to them or to their assistants um, and tell them what I'm interested in. I want to hear about their lives. This isn't going to be some deal where you badmouth the opposite party. I, I never get into that. This is about your life, what you're trying to do to help the city of Milwaukee or whatever your job is. That's what I try to do. Yeah. 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 When you're when you're telling those, are you like, what is the the economics of it? Are you doing these stories or these sort of vignettes on spec and then submitting them to the various agencies that that are known to publish it? Or are you being assigned in some cases or, or is it a mixture of serendipity like the person that you that you just mentioned that, you you know, this hypothetical person you meet on the street? And you have a conversation, you record it, take some photos, and that becomes a vignette. Uh, or is it, or and or, could it be some editor somewhere says, hey, Tom, um, we need a, a human interest story covering these general topics. What do you have? Or what can you get me by the end of the week? How, how does it work for you? I write for a fairly successful progressive publication in Milwaukee called the Shepherd Express. It's, it's somewhat like the LA Weekly, or uh, I've forgotten some of these other big city, uh, you know, kind of alternative newspapers, I guess you mm-hmm. call them. And the yeah. Shepherd Express, as once a month, uh, has a four, four color magazine, and every day has an online newspaper with about 200,000 views. You know, it's hard to tell, maybe 60,000 readers. I write for them mainly. I mean, I, I'm not. You know, they, they let me, I have a column called Central City Stories. I also write feature stories, and they pretty much let me do what I want to. You know, I might submit one story a week for a while and then not another one for a month. You know, it's just whatever I'm interested in, I try to I try to write that story, shoot that picture, and then they publish it. Uh, there's only been a couple of occasions where they've turned me down. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm not a progressive and I'm not a conservative. I'm, I'm just trying to be objective about you know, <laughs> yeah. telling people's stories. It's the other if, right? Conservative, <laughs> progressive, well, we have, or in, objective. In media, yeah, in the media, we have you know this particularly lately since Trump. Mainly, we have these you know people in the media who are just suddenly decided they're going to be one side or the other, and they'll right. do everything they can to, to slant a story in the direction that, whether you're conservative or liberal or you're progressive or whatever you are. And uh, I don't think that serves journalism very well at all. Yeah. And that's the art of it, right? The photojournalism side of it is sometimes even just a change of perspective of the photo, not even the, the story, not even the words that go along with the photo, but uh, shooting from a lower perspective or higher or what you choose as the photographer to compose in the background of that photo or what the subject is wearing or how you choose to process that photo. All these things can lead to preconceived notions about what you're getting to as an artist, what are you trying to tell that complements what you're writing about in the in the the written word narrative, right? So how over over the, how do you make, remain in that objective kind of fairground in there as a journalist that's telling a story? Like, are the stories the stories that you tell very very much matter of fact, or are they more narrative? Like, how do you stay in between? They're, they're more narrative, you know. They're they're almost. I mean, they're, they're, a lot of them are Q&A type interviews, although I insert myself a lot. But mm-hmm. not you just throw a question at somebody and I have them answer. It's where I in, interject my conversation and my opinion, like we are now, kind of, except they do more of the talking. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of my style. Um, as far as uh, 
I mainly shoot casual portraits where I can. And uh, I used to, whenever I taught photography, uh, portrait photography, I would always, for me, it's very important to include a sense of place when you're taking a picture of someone. Okay? Mm -hmm. That means, what is the environment in which they live? Okay? If that's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I try to do with, with my portraits. Have a sense of place. Get a sense of when you look at the picture, not just at the person, but kind of, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's where they live. That's their environment. Yeah. When, you, when you're out there doing these, these shots, are you, are you, or have you ever felt like you're in danger? And you like you are a white guy walking around a black neighborhood with expensive camera gear, right? <laughs> I mean, like that's you know, there's a certain amount of physics that goes in there too. <laughs> and so, I, I, no, yeah, I, I was assaulted once, uh, wasn't a pleasant experience, but yeah, um, too bad. I mean, I went right back. It's like that's just a, a small. It was a it was a small cadre of youth. You know, juvenile drug dealers that assaulted me and, and th that's just not the whole story it's just yeah. happened to me you know and it happens yeah. i've been called names i had my tires slashed a few things like that but that that's just a tiny part of my experience and and uh i just choose to to let that go yeah yeah you know, no, the, the, this you know place I, I don't feel I, I feel i mean you ask do, do you feel kind of oh worried and stuff right <laughs> well like any environment i'm careful not to park on a, a dark street or you know stuff like that but i mean no i'm not i'm not that worried i, I find most people are just decent nice people that are just trying to get by yep yep yeah absolutely you know and then on the flip side of that of of the stories that you've done you know over the over the years is there one story that that sticks out into in your mind as this is a story that I feel like made the most impact that may have changed lives or perceptions or or prejudices? Mm -hmm. Like, is there a story like that that sticks out in your head? There are several. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one that I, I give a I give a lecture now and then to suburban Rotarian groups, uh, white groups, to try to explain what life is like in the inner city and maybe to try to get them to engage with a person opposite their color if mm -hmm. possible but um there's one story that well there's a couple but one in particular is just heart-wrenching and this woman <clears throat> i don't want to name her but she uh over a period of two years she lost five members of her family to murder wow uh, i think it was two two nephews and three cousins that were murdered in, in the inner city. That's one uh, uh, that really made an impact on me. And I've gotten to know her a little better. And, and I'll, she's got courage. She's, you know, she's making a comeback and she's trying to do things she can. Uh, and, and other stories are domestic violence stories. Uh, those are so tragic where, oh, one in particular were these two women uh, that were cousins I'm talking women in their 50s, black women. Mm -hmm. Their two daughters, who were cousins, their two daughters, who were both in their 20s, were both murdered within six months of one another by their domestic partners. That's in one family, one tragedy, and two murders. Um, and I told that story. And uh, there's just so many, you know, just so many. I, I, the other, I, well, here's one that'll drop you. Uh, just happened. I just uh, interviewing this guy for uh, it's it's, a, it's for a, kind of a broad subject, but this gentleman uh, was telling me his backstory. Get this: he he grew up in uh, a small town in uh, no, he didn't grow up. He was born in a small town in Mississippi. His mother was pregnant with him when she was fifteen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that was really frowned upon in their community. You know, I mean, you, you, that was very shameful. So the family moved up to Madison to be with the grandmother. And then he was born there, the guy I'm talking about. Well, this guy grew up thinking that his mother was his sister and his grandmother was his mother because it was too shameful to, for, to, you know, yeah. to admit that in the family. In the course of his... Uh, time up through the 10th grade he lived in he went to 10 different schools in 
six different cities, and he was physically abused by his uncle. Those kind of stories, and but by the way, he went on to, uh, he, he was convicted of homicide when he was when he was in his early 20s, but he got out and he is went on to get his master's degree. Now he's working on his doctorate. So it's another one wow. of those amazing wow. stories. Just That's amazing. crazy. But um, those kind of stories just break your heart. I mean, it's almost like this really happened. You know, I mean, you couldn't make this up. And this guy went through it. How can, you know, it's so hard to re recover from these kinds of issues. I don't think people realize that in inner city like Milwaukee, Chicago, places like that, because of uh, the loss of jobs for black people in like the 80s and 90s, there became a kind of a third world economy, uh, mainly cocaine. And uh, a lot of a lot of these families lost their fathers. There were no fathers. Either the fathers were kind of deserted the family for, for drug reasons or they were put in prison. So, and that's still going on. I mean, it's something like, I think it's 85% of the inner city black families are have a mother, you know, one, one single parent as a mother. Yeah. So that, that, that is, uh, that's just, uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's not good for children at all to have that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And at a certain point it becomes normal. Right. Or yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, two parent home, two parent homes. Like when I was growing up, two parent homes were kind of the outlier. Right. Like it was either it was it wasn't the Cosby show sort of dynamic all the time. But at the yeah. same time, we weren't we weren't unhappy. You know, we weren't you know, we weren't suffering because of that. I had a two parent, a two parent home, you know, up until my mom passed away. But mm -hmm. and I feel like you're right. Like I feel like having two parents in the home to, you know, manipulate against each other <laughs> as a kid <laughs> to have that. And, you know, to have that is, I think, part of why I'm able to do some of the things that I do today or have some of the outlooks yeah. or insights um, both ways. And even those patterns with regard to how are you going to parent your kids comes from those those Absolutely. engrams that happen at that yeah. age. Right. The. Uh, <clears throat> Particularly young black men, you know, I'm talking about teenage men or even a little younger. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very hard on them not to have a dad. And there's so many good people, good black men in Milwaukee uh, through nonprofits or just on their own that are, that are trying to fill in, you know, and be, uh, be a dad to, to these, these guys. Uh, these guys, need, they need discipline. You know, we all do. You remember, you know, I do. When you grow up, you're a teenager, you absolutely need discipline. And if you're a boy, you know, you have a little more freedom. So, and then you can get in trouble if your friends are involved in, you know, shady activities, you might, you might get in trouble. And yeah. So, yeah, that, yeah. that's part of that culture. Yeah, it's interesting. I was explaining. To, I was having a, a a a parenting. What is a parent or disciplining conversation with my daughter uh, okay. a couple of, a couple of weeks ago? Uh, How she's old not, is she? She's nine, right? So we're we're having this discussion, and I was, you know, I like to use an, al analogies, and we were outside, and there was a on the side of the house. There's a lattice work with vines growing on it, right? So I said, basically, your parents are that lattice work. Right. As you're growing up, we're keeping you and you're growing, you're safe. You know, you're not going all over the place. But more important than that, we're, we're providing structure for you so that you can be the best you that you can be. Right. So mm -hmm. we in, in that analogy, we are the uh, lattice and you are that crazy vine that's trying to go all over the place. And it's the truth. Right. For anything yeah, without without some sort of structure, you know, i.e. discipline, structure, foundation, however you want to pose it without that, then things can run amok and not be what they're supposed to be, especially in the beginning, as things are just sort of finding out what what's a good direction, what's a bad direction to grow. You know, if you're not provided with some some gateways as to, yeah, that's the right way to go. You'll you'll definitely be successful of finding the sunlight if you go this way versus around the corner in the back of the house and all of this. So that's good. I like that. Yeah. yeah, there's a guy. Uh, there's a guy in Milwaukee. Uh, one of the people I admire the most. Uh, his name was Ed Hennings. He he was in, uh, he made the mistake of killing the, another gang leader when he was like 20. Hmm. 
he was put in prison for <clears throat> I think 27 years before he got out. But while he was in prison, he uh, he did read everything he could. He did every possible thing to help and educate himself. <clears throat> and when he got out, he became uh, well. He owns a small trucking company. He owns a beauty salon, among other things. He's very successful. And he uh, what he does is on his spare time, if he has any, he goes into schools and he talks to kids you know, about not wasting your life, about not get, making mistakes. But I'll never forget, he said, sometimes he'll go into a school, particularly like a middle school, and because all the teachers, elementary or middle, are generally women, the, these, these boys just gather around him, you know, just gather around him and hug him because mm. they don't have any, you know, they don't have anybody to identify with. I mean, not that women are bad or anything but you know you're, you're a boy you know you, right, you need right. you need some adult men around yeah yeah no absolutely yeah to pattern after and to you know good and bad right you know you have the adult men around doesn't mean they're all going to be amazing you could have adult men around and and you know pattern bad behavior you know just as soon as just as easy as you can of pattern course. good pattern good behavior so you know the, yeah, that's, that's i don't think there's a magic formula as if you just put two parents in the home everything's going to work out great you oh, know no. those parents may suck you're right so and which you good parents <laughs> two good parents see yeah, those details it's the details see? Yeah, the devil's wager in the little details. You've um, got, you know, I did send you, or I don't know if you can eventually show this, but I did send, oh, my website. That, that's yeah. what I was going to mention. Tom, uh, TomJonesAmerica.com, one word, TomJonesAmerica.com. And in that website, there'll be a gallery called Inner City Milwaukee. And uh, I just wanted to mention it because what I did you know, on that website, which is something I've not seen anyone do, no fine arts photographer do, and that is I I made it a scroll. You page down, there, there's individual pictures with, with a, a caption or maybe a couple sentences. But if you were to slowly scroll down that, that whole inner city gallery, it would almost be like a movie. You know, you get a sense of, of what life was like in the inner city. So. Anybody who's interested in that, uh, they could they could look at that, and it's pretty fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's TomJinsAmerica.com. One word. Mm -hmm. One word. Yep, I'll put that. I think you're down there. It. Yeah, that'll show up down there, and yeah. it'll also also be in the blog post for the episode and in the the YouTube notes or description if folks want to check that out. Uh, before we wrap this up, Tom, uh, just a couple of nerd photography nerd questions i love it. i could speak to photojournalists all day i could you know especially <laughs> on this topic that is essentially you know essentially me very close to me um uh, the the nerd part of this is gear you know you you bring uh -huh. certain gear with you for certain situations uh, in any genre of photography when you're doing inner city photojournalism or inner city street photography how what's your loadout look like what do you what do you look like when you show up at a you know, a location to, to well, do a little to show vignette. Up with a few lenses and a couple of cameras. <laughs> now I show up with one camera. It's a yeah. Nikon digital, you know, one of the newer Nikon digital models. Uh, and one zoom lens. I think it's a 20, 28 to 140, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason I do that, and I don't even, I don't even put a flash on anymore, you know, a, a, a strobe. It's very intimidating for, for if you're trying to engage a person or even get their, their portrait to have that gear thrown in their face, you know, or a tripod. Or I mean, it, it's just, even for me getting that picture taken, I don't like that. I find it, you know, it takes too long. It's intrusive. So I've tried to simplify, you know, simplify my approach with my gear. Yeah. Yeah, that makes and that, sense. That, that that makes absolute sense. Where I was going with that is, yeah, I'm curious if you you will downsize from the one camera, one lens mindset to no camera and smartphone and I'm, go in. No. You're not gonna do that. Tell me why. Tell me why. Yeah, seems like seems like that'd be long. ideal for what you're doing. <laughs> I've been doing this too long. Actually, you know that you bring that up. I've been looking at that i iPhone 14. You know, yeah. Pro 14. That. From what I've seen, it, it does some amazing pictures. You know, yeah, really it amazing. Does. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'll try it maybe. For now, I'm, I'm kind of going with what I'm used to. But uh, 
you know, we're going to someday we're going to come to having something like an iPhone as photographers uh, to carry around with us. Yeah. Uh, if you look at cinematography and how that gear is downsized and downsized uh, to now, where if you ever seen a <clears throat> a shoot, I mean a high end <clears throat> movie shoot, you'll see the the cameramen have really small cameras. Yeah. Same yeah. with the sound people. Yeah, I'm using I'm using a similar camera to what you're talking about now. It's a it's a Panasonic BGH1. It's a box camera yeah, that's right. modular and it's it's literally Netflix certified. So yeah. I would imagine a you know hundreds of these things are floating around Hollywood and Bollywood and wherever else. Um, Everybody's a visual storyteller now, right? <laughs> On YouTube. <laughs> That's it. Everyone, you know, and when is and when everyone has superpowers, no one has superpowers. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I did want to mention to you uh, before we wrap up here is yeah. I really enjoyed your uh, your program on uh, the Flickr Foundation, mm. um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, maybe you could. Why don't you go ahead and explain it first, and then I'll then I'll give you my feedback. Sure, sure. Yeah, and folks can go back and check out that episode that we released a couple of weeks ago. But essentially, uh, the the structure of it all is this week in photo. This podcast is now part of a trifecta of companies that are owned by Smug Mug. So there's Smug right. Mug, Flickr, and now this week in photo. I.e., you know, I'm part of the family over there. The last couple of weeks ago, they announced an initiative or Flickr and Smug Mug announced an initiative called the Flickr Foundation, which is its main, you know, you have to watch the thing. It's a, you know, it's like a half an hour, 40 minutes long. But the main thrust of it is uh, it's an altruistic sort of effort to archive the most important photos that are in the Flickr library. The Flickr, as you might imagine, has, uh, I don't even know what the number is, a bazillions yeah. of images in there. It's growing every day. And a lot of them are very important, like images from NASA and SpaceX and this and that. You know, So these are very archival. important yeah. archival images that need to stick around beyond our carbon-based life form lifespans. So that initiative is designed to make sure that happens. So that mm -hmm. photos are here well beyond any of us so that you can be sure that when you take a photo and it is archived it'll be around for the you know i guess the aliens when they dig up the server <laughs> so, it'll, still, it'll still be there so that's the gist you know so that's your setup for whatever you're going to say tom okay yeah and what i'm going to say is <clears throat> what i like about that is i i think you i think you skip something there i believe if i'm correct that that you as a Flickr photographer or a poster you, you can choose photos to be put into that database right you, yeah that, so that yeah. there yeah that was a question i i posed because i knew just about oh, that's right. uh, yeah that was a question like how do you how do you flag an image to be archived so they're working a lot of that out now right. because you you don't want to have a switch that's automatic like in Flickr oh, right now gosh. you can automatically say everything is is creative commons licensed <laughs> right and even the shots that you upload of your big toe are now creative commons licensed archival is a bigger deal than that so there's yeah. uh, you know they're working out what the exact parameters are going to be around what gets included and what doesn't and what control the photographer or Flickr customer has over what's going to be included and what's not absolutely not you know like your private shots of your kids you may or may not want those archived sure. right mm -hmm. so those there's questions like that this is that the announcement of that foundation i look at it from a you know a a podcaster news teller sort of standpoint um is basically revealing this is a direction we're moving in because we care about photography for these reasons and we feel like these these things need to be saved and archived and we're taking steps to that end we're not at the end yet but it's a it's a very strong yeah, beginning well, for me for me on a sort of a selfish basis is what i like about it is i believe that a lot of my work that i've done in my in my uh, career uh a lot of rural and small town historical images of people who are no longer alive. Also, my inner city uh, black cultural pictures, uh, I believe, will be historic. Okay, mm -hmm. and I want I want to have them preserved in some way, shape, or form. Now, I, you know, I got a plan to sub give them to the Smithsonian or something, just so they're there for anybody who wants to research. But, but with Flickr. 
<clears throat> you can, I can choose what I want and they will be there, you know? Yeah. So yeah. a generation from now, somebody's researching what life was like in, in 19 or 2020 and in inner city, you know, America, I, my images, some of my stories are there for them to, them to get a, a sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, some, the, there's a, digital information, of course, is is key, especially for just day to day life here in 2022, going into 2023 as we record yes. this. Um, the photography, of course, I'm biased because I love photography. I call myself a photographer. Yeah. I'm biased. I think photography is at the close to the top of the list when it comes to things that need to pre be preserved for future generations. Along with that is video as well. So I don't know. YouTube, I, I would argue, has become a, uh, I don't know, critical, you know, in the way that we communicate, the way we do things, the, the way we learn, you know, this, all this just a, an uncountable number of important, there's a lot of crap up there, but an uncountable number of important educational videos, which makes it a resource. Oh. I don't know where, what happens to that stuff, right? And what the policy is for 50 years from now, if I want to go see that cat playing, playing piano video, will I, be, <laughs> will, will I be able to see that cat? Yeah, I don't know. Let me, let me respond to that because me personally, I, I'm an autodidact. If you know what that is, that means mm -hmm. I, I have a thirst for knowledge. I'm always yes. trying to learn new things. Yeah. But I know absolutely nothing about cooking, nor do I care about it nor woodworking. And I am just fascinated. I'm almost mesmerized with some of these YouTube videos that, that these top expert woodworkers, great chefs, just to watch them work because yeah. it's an art form. It's an art form that I, that, that, that I, that I can't do. And I, it's very interesting to watch them do that. I'd never get a chance to do that if it weren't for YouTube. Right, yeah, it's I'm critical. Huge, I'm a huge jazz fan, a huge jazz fan, going all the way back. And uh, there are such wonderful, wonderful jazz videos up there of the old old timers playing jazz or or recordings, you know, that I, w I could never access before. I can now access on YouTube. Anyway, Flickr Foundation, yeah, I think it's it's a great thing. It is, yeah. yeah can I saying. ask you one last thing? And, you yeah. know, maybe this won't be on, but uh, now I'm turning into the interviewer. But I'm real Bring curious. It. Uh, how you how you got started with this week in Fudo? Because you've been doing this a while, haven't you? How, how yeah. did you come up with that idea, and how did it get started? Yeah, ironically, I didn't come up with the original idea for the original concept of This Week in Photo. Um, a couple of uh, friends of mine, uh, Alex Lindsay and Scott Bourne, which are pretty well-known photographers in the industry. They're, Alex is more of a video production guy, worked on Star Wars and all those sorts of things, some of those things. And Scott Bourne is a celebrated wildlife slash bird photographer. So they decade plus ago, what, maybe 15, not 15, maybe 13, 12, 13 years ago, they started this podcast called This Week in Photography. And okay. the and it was just, it was audio at the time. It was just, you know, two guys, maybe sometimes three sitting around a table recording this audio and publishing it out to the web through this brand new thing called podcasting. So it was very much an experiment. So I joined the show a couple of times way back in the day. I was the, uh, at the time I was working at Adobe on the Lightroom and Photoshop team. And uh, I was on the show as a guest from time to time. Then layoffs happened at Adobe, you know, a couple of hundred, close to 800 people got laid off in one day and I was one of them. And, oh. and coincidentally at the time they had decided not to do the podcast anymore. Uh, and I thought, Hey, you know what? I need a project. I'm a marketing guy. I'm a photographer. Let me take it over and see what I can do with it and see if I can bring it up beyond this couple hundred uh, downloads and make something real out of it, or at least the the idea at the time was at least I could use this opportunity while I'm looking for my next real gig to keep my knives sharp, you know, and dive into this project and see if I can take it to the next level. So that's what I did, and that was that was a decade plus ago, <laughs> and, and now this week in photo is a kind of a major media property uh, with a network of photographers and a community and. 
And as we know, the latest chapter has I've sold the company or been acquired by Smug Mug. So mm -hmm. and and there we go. So now in, into 2023 is the next chapter. We'll see what that looks like. So that's a yeah, well, that's the Reader's it's Digest it's condensed version of <laughs> what happened. <laughs> well, it's, it's a great program. I'm so glad you're doing it because thank uh, you. You know, it, it, photographers don't have a lot of places to go other than looking at pretty pictures. You know, or maybe going to a, a to a uh, Photoshop, you know, tutorial or something. But yeah. this is different. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That means a lot, especially you know. I love I love the I love getting feedback. I mean, everybody loves positive feedback, but I love, particularly love positive feedback from photojournalists that that value what we're doing on this week in photo. Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So let's end it yeah, with this. Yeah. Um, what's next for Tom Jen? Like what's what's the project? <laughs> what's the project that you're like, I can't I can't sleep at night because I need to get this project started. What's, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I've got about three stories I'm working on, and I'm pretty frustrated with my subjects right now because they, they're not getting back to me, but I think probably because it's the Christmas holidays. But, but no, there's nothing specific other than trying to keep doing what I've been doing for as long as I can do it because uh, particularly racism <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that kind of divide is, is prominent in the world. And yeah. uh, I'd like to make a small contribution to see if we can't help overcome that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for thank you, you know, from a podcast host perspective for coming on the show, but also sure. as someone who grew up in inner cities. I mean, like you said, I, you mentioned I grew up um, part of my growing up life on the south side of Chicago with yeah. half of my relatives on the west side of Chicago. And, you know, then we we're out in the suburbs of Chicago. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of different versions and a lot of different chapters that that combine to make us who we are today, yeah, right? Yeah. And the, you know, back then, like I'll say, I'll leave with this, like with my my Air Force career, I did eight years as a combat photojournalist in the Air Force. Yeah. And mm -hmm. while you're in, while I, and I'll, I think a lot of military people will agree with this, when you're in an active duty, you can't wait to get out because it, you know, like it sucks. I can't wait to go back to the civilian life, and, <laughs> you know, you know and, uh, not everyone, but some people. Um, but I'll tell you, those those years were some of the best, most formative years of my life. Right. Yes. Of even if it was mundane and a grind and why do we have to get up this early for nothing? You know, it, all that combined to, I feel like, allow me to do some of the things that I'm able to do today. So, you know, thank, it's interesting thank you, you Air Force. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned that because I've, I've done some stories on uh, like middle-aged or beyond middle-aged black men that are fairly successful in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> many of them joined the military out of high school. Mm -hmm. the, the Marines or, you know, the Army. And it turned them around. I mean, it really, they were kind of rebellious, you know, when they, and uh, they, they'll, they're not saying it was great, but they're saying that it really taught them responsibility. Yeah. And values. yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't a rebellious kid. I was more of the, you know, I would, my daughter would say I'm a cross between the Fresh Prince and Carlton with a little Urkel <laughs> sprinkled in. <laughs> <laughs> But she'll say that that's me, and then I'll say yes. But I inside I feel like a Morpheus from the Matrix, right? So. By the way, uh, speaking of podcasting, and just to close this out, yeah, put a little plug in for my own daughter. She is uh, the head of Amazon's new program, podcasting. She, she's in charge of the whole thing. Wow! All the new podcasts that go through Amazon go through her <laughs> so That's she's got great. a great team of, of people that work for her and she she likes her job a lot she got into podcasting early and uh, worked her way up to ultimately the company she worked for was bought out by amazon and there she is. <laughs> there you go there you go that's how you do it but that's yeah. audio but that's not video yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah, we we could talk for hours about that because it's a. Uh, I'm actually outlining a book that I'm going to write in 23 about that particular kind of idea of 
you know, it, not that this, like, you know, I told the story about the podcast and none of that was planned, <laughs> right? No one plans to get laid off and then, you know, right. lick their wounds and start this thing. And do, so all, a lot of it was serendipity and right place, right time for that to happen. Yeah. But it's, it is very interesting to me how that we can now build something and like build our ideal job almost like what if i could just do mm-hmm. this yeah. you just build your do your i well it's photography whatever you build your ideal job online marketing whatever and then right. transplant it into being a real not real but being a more stable job because that's kind of what i did i built my ideal job that fits into what i think my lifestyle should and can be i built mm-hmm. i built it. it like this is pre-visualization of what your world can be so i pre-visualized it built it and then the kicker was and i wasn't planning on this obviously but the kicker uh-huh. was transplanting it into a larger company where now you're still doing the things that you love doing but now there's a net underneath it <laughs> right and some bedrock you're not walking a tightrope every month you know to make sure things right. happen no. you're able to execute on the things that you love and you know would do if you weren't getting paid a dime but now you're getting paid for it in the whole nine yards so i want to outline oh, yeah, that whole process it's like a whole new, it's like a whole new industry mm-hmm. is what you're describing it's, it's a whole new industry i mean i wouldn't yep. call it industry but a whole new avenue for uh, earning money and you know uh, having a purpose in your life it's no absolutely wonderful. yeah it's almost, it's and it's not new it's interesting because I'm, I'm a big fan of marketing too and copywriting and all the things and yeah. it's the the idea of pre-visualizing a career then transplanting into a larger organization that's not that's not new in fact educators online educators that are building online courses and, and that sort of thing have been doing this idea for years where they will build a full on master class about a piece of software, let's call it Photoshop or Lightroom or something, right? So build a full on master class with someone's software. You know, let's use, let's use a smaller example, like say on one or uh, Skylum or one of those companies. So you build the master class guide to using Luminar or something from Skylum. And yeah. then you sell it to the company instead of marketing it to the end user. You mm-hmm. sell that entire course to the company, and let them distribute it yes. as a way to sell their company. So now you're not you're not racing for every 1997 you can squeeze out of someone to buy your course. You've just yeah. sold this thing for sixty thousand dollars and you're done with it and it's over. You can go on to the <laughs> next course. <laughs> So I want to teach that too. So it's interesting. It's interesting how all that stuff works. I mean, you can do it all now from your from your spare room in your house or your it's apartment. It's wonderful. It's just yeah. wonderful. I'm, I'm glad I lived long enough to see it. It's just terrific. Right. Anyway, yeah. if you want to have me on again for any reason, I'm, I like being on your show. So, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hopefully, like we were saying during our pre-interview, we'll get to meet in person and uh, yeah, you know, break do. bread or have a beer together or something. I'll, I'll take my snowmobile out to your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> you only need it for halfway, and then it's good. After. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Go to the Rockies, and I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, just get to the top. You can ski down, and it'll get warmer. <laughs> so, all right, Tom, thank you so much for coming on. Throw, give us your, right. your, the URL to your website one more time before we, rack, before sure. we end this. Uh, my website is Tom, Tom Jens America. T O M J E N Z America, that's one word, dot com, Tom Jones America dot com. The newspaper I write for is called the Shepherd Express, which is the Shepherd Express dot com. So you can, it's a pretty good little newspaper if you want to learn more than just what I do. So, um, excellent. So I'll plug them a little too. <laughs> good, good. No, good. Yeah, and you know, like I said, I'll link I'll link t- uh, to both of those locations from okay. the description on the YouTube video and in the blog post, and we'll also have a little gallery of images on the blog post so people can see what's oh. going on from there. So, very good, my friend. Thank you for uh, okay. for let me bug you on a. You know, we're between the holidays. We're after Christmas and leading yeah. up to New Year's. So this is a down week for most people. So thanks for coming on. I appreciate oh, you, you taking the time. I've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. All right, Tom Jens. Thank you, sir. This is Twitter.